Hi, David, by the way. Hi. Hello. Matthew. Hi, Matthew. <laughs> um, I'm going to go with the first question from, um, from uh, Shaktopus. Um, okay. Uh, this is a question for the memory banks. Around 2000, 2001, you played a gig in the Olympia. Uh, you played an epic, really moving song called, I think, The Great North Sea. It was a new song. The crowd went crazy for it. You said it was definitely going to be on the next album. <laughs> but, uh, but that was the, the last I ever heard of it. Did it become another song, or will it be released at some time in the future? Not nitpicking, there's, there's been loads of great songs. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so just the, always wondered what happened to that one. The, the story with that was, that was, I think there's a charity show for the Haemophiliac Society, who got shafted when they had a load of contaminated blood, and there was a big legal case going on. And we knew someone who was involved, so I said I'd do this charity show at the Olympia, yeah. and that's that show. It was a great show, we played a three hour set, the longest set I've ever played. And the song that this guy is referring to is, it was called um, Northern Sea. Yeah, he has yeah. it here, it's the Great North Sea. Northern Sea, and this song was written, or at least partly written, the basis of it was written in 1994, so a long time before the show. And it sort of made occasional appearances. But well, during White Ladder, we started to play it. It was Clune's drum beat, which is kind of hypnotic yeah. tom beat, and a very sparse, and really it was ahead of, it was a song that was a precursor for me getting a bit more adventurous sonically and musically. So it, 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 it anyway, we played it a lot around that time, and I thought it might make an appearance, and I finished the lyrics and everything. But for whatever reason, maybe we didn't get the version, other things came along, it got eclipsed. Yeah. Um, I never made it onto a record. I still occasionally think about it, because it was a great drum riff, really hypnotic, and it was a very linear song based on sort of hypnosis, so as a sort of mantric kind of song. You think it's, it's of its period? Do you think it was of that time? It was, it was but I, I think it, could, it would survive perfectly comfortably now, yeah. amongst some of the things I'm doing. But I don't know whether I'll get round to, to doing a version of it, but that, that's the song that's been referred to. So it didn't get completely forgotten, it just didn't make it onto a record. Well, well it sounds like he, he wouldn't have been the only person at that show who would have, uh, like I said, it, it, it was very moving. We, we used to play it uh, uh, throughout that early, that period. Yeah. We played it occasionally. So um, it was sort of in the set every now and again. So for a very long show like that, we'll have just thrown whatever we fancied in. So uh, that one obviously made a. P I don't remember playing it. It, did, that it didn't, didn't even make a B side. It didn't make a B side. It was never. It, well, it was never recorded yeah. properly. So that's the story. I see. All, all right. We have a Yop. Um, the, 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 the names have become very interesting. Shaktopus Yop. Uh, hi, David. I think it was Dolan's Warehouse in Limerick, which was the first time I saw you. Lovely place. Also, Gaiety in Dublin was superb. Was a superbly intimate venue. Uh, wondering what you thought of Westport House as a venue this summer. It must have been an unusual play into such a spread of tastes and ages. We had a one-year-old there, and I saw yeah, people in their yeah. 70s, 80s, yeah. all loving the music at the event. It was, it was good. I mean, it was a beautiful place. I was blown away by Westport. Yeah. And the house and the grounds were gorgeous. The gig was... It's tricky trying to play new material to a rowdy festival crowd. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. so um, it was a bit of a... There was a little bit of give and take. I had to change the set, but it was it was a good gig. It was sweet. It was a beautiful place. I had a wonderful day. It, yeah, down in Westport. Um, you play, you obviously played Westport before. No, I haven't. No. Wow. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a really simple one now uh, from Merkin. Uh, what's the best gig you've ever played, and why? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know. There's been some really good ones. Um, I can tell you what a, the best gigs feel like. They feel like everything just clicks on some sort of perfect level. Yeah. And it's like you're slightly removed from the whole experience. Uh, I think someone described it as being like driving at night. But it, it's like, yeah, and my voice or would just be able to stretch wherever I want it to go. And then the conscious thoughts that usually have to steer the show, where should I go, what, what should I do? It just becomes second nature, instinctive. 
and nothing's really I, I'm just in the moment continually you stay there and hopefully I like the songs where it transcends the, the just the basic what we need is a buzzing fridge yeah. at this point <laughs> uh, karma police yeah, that's the arrest this fridge <laughs> uh, so yeah basically it's it's um, that that's what it feels like I don't know I've been lucky there have been a lot of great shows and um, they, we just had a fantastic one in Vancouver recently where it was just it crystallised in some kind of the audience were listening it was like it was going from pin drop silence to this sort of incredible roar and I just wow. I got okay. into a sort of trance with the whole thing and the emotion just built and built and before you know it you've sort of it's almost like an out of body experience anyway that's how it feels yeah I've heard some people describe it that, that you're you're actually, you're thinking nothing for a change. There's actually nothing going through your head at all. The well, no, because you're not having to do thinking, you're just yeah. doing. Yeah. And, and just, just totally immersed in the doing and singing and making of music and everything else is just becoming instinctive. Yeah, yeah. Martin Gore once said that when you're thinking about, about whether you put a coloured sock in with a whitewash while you're on stage, then maybe it's time to reevaluate re how, you, how you approach live music. Um, okay, another really simple one again, um, from, from Emil. Um, uh, what's the best venue gig you've ever played? Same, same I, question, I, I, really. I, I don't know. There isn't one. There's no yeah. such thing. I've had amazing shows in a place, and then you go back next time thinking, this is going to be incredible, yeah, yeah. and it's nothing like the same. So it's like, what? You know, where, 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 where's the, say, the crowd we had last time? There's no such thing. I think a, a great venue... For me, I think the best venues are theatres. That's all I would say. Yeah. You know, a, a, a beautiful theatre, so uh, where you can do a listening show as well as lift the energy. So that would almost be in every city. There's a, there's, 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 there's a special theatre, really, isn't there? Yeah. The, the Olympia being the one here. For, well, for me anyway. That's how I see starting in music there. Um, okay, from September twenty third, nineteen eighty nine, which is a. Uh, a very interesting name. Are you doing all the questions? Yeah, I'm doing some of them, yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Why, why which one? No, I'm not. Yeah? No, there's this one about which colour's favourite colour of grey. Def yeah, definitely yeah, do that definitely one. Yeah, definitely do that one. I've got the answer. Oh, here's a, again, seem, it seems quite generic, this one, but uh, if there was one song by another artist you wish you could have written, what would it be? I, I, again, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, what do you say to a question like that? I, 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 there isn't one. I don't go around think. It's not. I don't think like that. Yeah. Oh, I wish I'd written wish that. Written well, that. I, I don't. I'm fucking too busy trying to do my own shit. There's there's too many good songs to single one out. Yeah, I I, I, I agree. Uh, from PTH 2009, uh, what was it like to play in Waterford last July? Um, was it a good venue for the gig? Would you return? That's a strange one. But yeah. Uh, do you well, even remember just, that? Just carry just go on. on. Yeah. Okay, from uh, Basque, which I think is, is how I, I say his name. Um, uh, yo, David, what's your favourite shade of grey? Uh, do bear in mind it's going on the wall of my prison cell. And so, uh, no, it's so not his prison cell, a prison oh, cell. Oh, oh, really? Yeah. I don't wow. think he's going to yeah. paint his own prison cell. I don't think he'd get a fucking choice of grey. <laughs> I don't think you do. I don't think that's a new, yeah, that's a new system. So, uh, was... so, so let's not get, get too dreary. Keep it light. Uh, I know, I saw you in the pint back in 2005 and it was an excellent gig. Right, Ireland, so let's just, yeah. fuck that, but let's yeah. just have a look at the, the grey. He's got some shades there. of grey, it's not there. The well, I'll tell you what it, it was, it was, um, oh, I don't know, what was it called? It, it was but, a, a colour chart. Yeah, it was. Where's this colour chart gone? Yeah, it's not here. I, it hasn't been sent to me. Yeah, okay. Down the management. Uh, Down it, the management. It, it was there a minute ago. Well, basically, this is the colour grey of my plectrum. That's so, the actual uh, colour, colour grey. So this, this is my most frequently used colour of grey. Yeah. I probably prefer a slatier, deeper grey. So there was one of the chart that you sent me, Basque, <laughs> uh, like bottom left, pale version of, you know, arsewipe grey or whatever it was called. That was my favourite. <laughs> it was a slightly bluer grey. So it had a bit more jollity in there. There was a bit of depth of colour rather than just grey. Oh, there we go, look. Yeah. Dim yeah. Diamond Vogel yeah. Pale Diamond Vogel Pale State. Uh, I mean, that is that is like a no, sort no. of, that's like a techno track. Yeah, yeah, Diamond Vogel Pale Slate. Pale uh, Slate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Besides, even it's better. A, it's not a, great, right. a great Diamond title. vocal, pale slate. Yeah. I love, I love all the words there. They just, where do they come does, from? Does Dutch boy showdown? Yeah, day. Dutch uh, boy showdown. We don't want that. No, no, no. no that's, does, does let's not get carried away. Uh, Farrell and Borg. No, it's got, it's got to be fuck yeah. Farrell and Borg. Yeah. We're, we're going in with <laughs> Diamond vocal, pale Diamond slate. Diamond vocal, pale slate. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, here comes um, here comes a contemporary one. Uh, so two days ago, you two announced, or oh, from from um, Steve ULB. Um, two days ago, you two announced the release of the latest studio album for a limited time, and are giving it away free to iTunes. I reckon they are doing this to combat the whole music piracy thing. What are your opinions? Good, bad, so on. I don't think it's anything to do with music piracy, mm. but obviously. Um I think it's just to do with getting attention. It's a publicity stunt, clearly. And it's also sending a loud message that, you know, ownership is over. You just give that shit away. They know they'll make mills, million upon million, when they're touring the record. They want the record to connect, and it's anything to help it connect. And this is the desperate bid that you have to make to try and get people to a, big, a, a lot of people to connect with the music. Yeah. So you'd think by giving it away to everybody who's got an iTunes account, it would be a good start. Uh, maybe it will be, I don't know. But everybody's got some different slant, haven't they, these days? Yeah, the record's going to be I, I, I find every anyway. spin on how to release a record incredibly boring. Yeah. You know, I, I, I just make a great record and just go out and sing the bloody thing. But everyone's trying to put a spin on it. It's a sort of media device, really. So, obviously, piracy has been always been a part of, of music and um, the music industry. And these days, it's, there's not even any need to go to those extremes. You yeah. can just stream anything you want on YouTube or whatever. There's always something available if you know how to look. So, um, you know, my kids don't always think about buying a track. They just listen to it, yeah. a video of it or whatever. So uh, the, the, the world of ownership is over. The numbers are, to say, they're depressing and down on last year yeah. or whatever. Every year, it's just like, Jesus. You know, uh, soon it'll be like they sold a hundred copies. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. it's 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 so. Uh, I think it sends a loud message anyway that that music isn't worth much. That recorded music in that way, but it's as a front for your full media campaign and then live campaign. It, it's it's a, it's getting it out like as an advert for the show. I suppose yeah. so that's that would be my take on it. I, I, I do find it refreshing when people talk about ownership um, be, being over and and. Um, I, I think, yeah, the, 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 U2, the U2 thing came as a surprise to me anyway. So I haven't even, even had time to form an opinion. No, well, I, I, I only found out about it today. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Stella, the artist, um, when you go off on a tangent at the end of your live performances, as you fantastically do, uh, how much of it is rehearsed? Do, do you just sing the lyrics that come to mind? Um, by the way, Mutineers is my fave album, yet especially the title track. It never fails to give me butterflies. Um, yeah, when I go off on a tangent in Nemesis, which is probably what she's talking about, yeah. it's, it's never a, a rehearsed thing. So the song just keeps changing. So we might strike upon ideas live during the concert, and the next day we'll go, oh, you know how we did that? Well, don't bring the drums in. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's the extent of rehearsal. Like, don't bring them in so quick. I'll say, leave it longer. Let, the, let, let it go down deeper. Let's get quieter. Yeah. That would be the extent of the sculpting. And in terms of the lyrics, that's just whatever's going through my head. So sometimes I'll get onto a theme, and for a few gigs in a row, I'll explore the same thing. And other times, I'll just be, it'll be completely different every night. At the moment, it's different every night. Yeah. So I, I'll just be making things up. It'll be to do with... <laughs> Well, uh, if I'm completely preoccupied on stage, it can be a bit of an issue. Yeah. Because if, you know, I got completely distracted the other night, to be honest, and we were doing it in Los Angeles. I think there was some idiot down the front just shouting and shouting and shouting. And I, I, was, I was just thinking, he was getting on my tits. And suddenly I was at the end of the song and I was like, shit, it's the bit where I've got to make shit up. But I, com I was completely dragged <laughs> me out of the song. He kept bellowing the shit at me. I completely forgot what I was supposed to be doing. And I, I didn't have anything in my mind. I just kind of stood there playing the guitar for a long time. So, um, so no, it's not a rehearsed thing. It's a spontaneous thing. <laughs> and do you, and do, you do, do that so you can respond to things that happen almost imme immediately? Or, or you just left that completely open? Well, I, I so like the really, openness, the, t yeah. the terror of having to come up with something in the spur of the moment. A little bit of terror. I, I, yeah. I, I, like, I, I, like, the, I like that. Because it, 
it vaporizes all the other mental activity yeah. instantly. It's like if you've got to sort of come up with something. And I think the audience get it. I think they can tell the difference. It's like, oh, the band have played this before, or they haven't. I, th I think they know when it when it's just going somewhere of its own volition. I, I believe that as well. Actually, they do they do know when you're you, you're actually pulling that out yeah, of the air. Yeah, different. Yeah. Okay. Here's here's a, here's a um, here's a really simple one. Are you still playing with that nut that nutter of a drummer? No. So. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, the, the, the problem Sorry, with that is which, which nut of a drummer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the beautiful clune is... is uh, we could is do an of, hour about drummers, probably. Yeah, yeah, the beautiful clune is is he's chilling at home these days. Yeah. So, no, I haven't played with clune for ages. Yeah. Not since 2007. So, um, but who knows? You know, never know what the future holds. Okay. <laughs> um... Favorite artist of the moment. Um, that's from Fifi. Okay, yeah. I, I I got a favorite track, so I'll just give you that. It's called Despedida. D e s p e d i d a. Okay. It's a Brazilian track by Maria Rita. So that would be my recommended choice. It's a Perfect. beautiful piece of music. Wonderful piece of music. Um, okay. Uh, from Job Seeker. Great name. Um, in your classical uh, song, this year's love. Classical. Who? Classical song, yeah. <laughs> um, where was I? Uh, yeah. Who or what was your inspiration for this song? Well, that, that's a, that song was... I wrote that song because I was asked to. And as such, it's a, a, a fairly interesting sort of th song to study for me. It's become definitely one of my most enduring songs and one that I feel I'm getting better and better at singing and playing. It's utterly simple, a guileless piece of music. It just, it just is. It's very, very simple. There's nothing to it. And I was asked to write a song for a film called This Year's Love. Mm. And that's how that came about. And when I was asked it, I'd never written a song to order before, so I thought this was a, a dangerous territory to be in. It's like I was suspicious yeah, of... of yeah. I thought, is this how it works? Someone just asks you to write a song, you just write it. But of course, this is how most of the great songs in the history of the 20th century were written, until about 1960, when everyone started getting their own ideas. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was before that everyone was just writing songs, songs for other order, people, yeah, yeah. for musicals or for whatever. Yeah. So, you know. Um, that was a happy experiment then. So it, it was, a, yeah, it was an interesting thing. And I thought, well, Jesus, Dave, you, you know, beggars can't be choosers. You've been asked. Um, just get down and see what you can do, and, and this is what happened. And yeah. I, it didn't cost me much effort. I think it cost me like half a day, a day, and I'd finished it and recorded a demo of it. The director loved it, so we cut the track. But in the end, the film, r the music rights for the film were bought by V2, oh. and they just put all their own bands throughout the film. So my music was completely removed from the, from the scenes where it was going to be, and that was going to be the title song at the end. Wow. So it just ended up appearing on the radio in the back of a scene about halfway through the film, very, very briefly. So uh, it technically appears in the film. But that was the reason that song was written, and I, 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 it's... It's, it's stood the test of time, so it proved all my sort of the hoodoo, you know, mm. of, of what's pure and where, what's integrity and is this right or wrong. It's just a load of bollocks. Just get on, if someone asks you to write a song, get on and write it. It'll either, write you'll either be a good song yeah, or a yeah. bad song. So that one came out good. I, yeah, yeah. You, you did a, a very nice video for that as well. That's probably why it's been referenced as classical, because it's, it's, it's a piano video, isn't it? It's a very pretty... Yeah. Very pretty video. Um, ba -ba -ba <laughs> it's Godzilla. What, I'm gonna, what, what's your favourite type of cheese? My favourite type of cheese is Vacheron Mont d'Or. A nice drippy kind of brie. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, baby. Get one of those in every now and again. Yeah, and get the old Cars water biscuits involved. A few oh, grapes see, yeah, and a few yeah. bits of celery on the side. Happy days. <laughs> so it was a good question, actually. Um, from all three, um, can you tell me about your inspirations for The Other Side on A New Day at Midnight? Uh, one of my all-time favourite tracks. Uh, well, I think this was just after my dad had died, so clearly it has this yeah. incredibly sombre, kind of heavy, grief-laden vibe, really. I think that's where it came from. I wasn't really thinking about 
it just came out anyway. So it's, it, the, the main lyric isn't really about that, but it, it, clearly that's the emotion that underpins it. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, Sailor Heart, um, will you ever be over to play Canada soon? I just played Vancouver. Yeah. Played Toronto in May. And I'll be back to play Toronto Massey Hall in just about a month's time. So, okay, perfect. So, you know, get your ass to Toronto, get a ticket to Massey Hall, baby. Okay. okay um, That's a great venue. That's a beautiful venue. Really? Yeah. Oh, so you, that was a question earlier on. Do, yeah. There is Not some the, venues oh, that, yeah. that just well, it's well, it's stand The up, Ryman Auditorium, you know, yeah. Olympia Theatre, mm. Massey Hall, fantastic places. You know, yeah, there are, there are venues that are steeped in history, but, um, you know, you never know where the magic's going to strike, that well, magic gig. It's well, like you can play in the best venue. doesn't mean you're going to have the best show. Well, you've seen venues come and go as well, haven't you? Um, yeah. You obviously remember, remember Barrow Lands. I uh, do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, that was one of my favourite favorite venues. It still is of all, all time. Um, special one. Uh, do you play fantasy football? No. No. Uh, Andy Dawn 11. What do you do to unwind from the music business? Yeah, unwind. I'm not a great unwinder. Yeah. So I, it's something I'm work. I'm working on it, as I say on the new record. I'm working on it, baby. So, um, yeah. What do I do? My favourite thing is to get out into nature. So, uh, I have physical craving. Touring and recording is a bit like sensory deprivation. It's weird because you internalise. Everything is internal. Yeah. So the songs are in there. The imagery is in there. So you kind of you reach back into previous experiences to flesh out the music you're making. But really, you're just stuck in a room, a darkened room, most of the time. Or on the tour, you're basically on a bus, in a hotel room, yeah. at the venue, in the dressing room. You don't really get out much. And I'm an outdoor person. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a creature of the light. Yeah. So I like mornings, I, you know, I like to be outside. I like nature, I like being out in the wild. That's where I want to be. So that's what I do to unwind. If I get some time, I, I'd like to go to the country and just get out in the, in the nature stuff. Would you, would you actually bother, bother with farming? Would you, would you go that far? Farming? Yeah. Like I'm not, get I, wouldn't chickens, be a I wouldn't be a farmer. No. I, I couldn't deal with, you know, dealing with shooting animals and shit in the head. Yeah, that'd be a bit much, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, you know, maybe a vegetable farmer. Yeah, yeah, I, could, yeah. I could grow some stuff. Like um, the good life. This, I feel a like sense. a bit like Nigel Tufnell in Spinal Tap here. I could work in a shoe <laughs> yeah, shop. in a shoe shop. <laughs> so, did you uh, take I could, a size eight? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, I could, I could, I could, anyway, no, I've never thought of farming. That's not, that sounds like hard work and you've got to get it, yeah. that's too early in the morning. Yeah. I'm not interested in that. I, I live on one, I, I live right, on okay. one. I, I observe it all day. Uh, I, I just, I like to go for walks, so. Get out in the fresh air. That's that's how I unwind. Um, okay, um, t Tombo, two thousand and one. Uh, uh, Birds without wings. Oh yeah. Uh, super song. Is it ever on your live set? Occasionally. Yeah. That's funny because I was just playing that today. So it's 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 for some reason lingering in my mind at the moment. And this is what happens. These songs come up and go, stick their hands up and say, "I'd like to be played." There's a lot of them now, so yeah. they, they, it will be played again, yeah. I, it wasn't so long ago that I played a version of it live, maybe a couple of years, but it doesn't happen very often. And, and do, you, do you have many of those? Because I know person, from personal experience, there's like the songs that are screaming to be, to be played live, the songs that they'll be hanging around, and eventually when you do give them an out, and you, you do tend to wonder why you didn't do it before. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I, I just, there's too many songs to fit into a set these days. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I just have to, occasionally I'll do an acoustic show or something and in the freedom of that moment, I can, I can go back and look at some of these songs. It's hard to drag all this stuff into the big set when you've got, the more people you have involved, the more you have to kind of play a game. Yeah, I, I, so yeah. you, you've got to push some buttons and you can't just, um, go, you know, navel gaze and go back into whatever you've, you can do a bit of it, but you can't just, you can't take it too far if you want to, would you, Play, a, would you do one of those specialist shows? Would you, would yeah, you I would. Do, well, for example, in, in, in a few years, it would be the 25th anniversary of my first Whelan show. Yeah. So in the back of my mind, I mean, I, I, I'd like to do a tour playing the music of the first couple of albums, specifically, you know, around yeah. Ireland for sure. So 
at, at an event like that, I, th I, I would be obviously playing most of the songs on the, on the early records. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you get these bands that do these kind of what, what someone calls battle reenactment, you know, <laughs> where you play an album, you go back and play your classic album. Yeah, well, it was you for know. Pixies anyway, do little. You know, that's uh, how I you know so it, it's, um, I don't know what I think of that. But um, yeah, I, I would definitely um, con contemplate a little acoustic tour yeah. to support that idea. So perhaps then some of these things uh, could, could be played. Yeah, did you think that was just, just trendy? People doing their, their debuts or well, their, their it, most favourite album? It just depends. Album. I think, it, you know, it's become a thing now, hasn't it? It's yeah. like, I don't, uh, yeah, so I, anyway, so, so, good, so good, so good luck to any musician who yeah. can get anybody to come to a show or buy a blinking t-shirt, do you know exactly. what I mean? These are hard times. Yeah. Do what you've got to do. Um, there's Luz here. He says, I have a few questions. What are your thoughts on the Irish music scene at the moment? Do you think it's too cliquey, small, but she's putting words in that. Uh, can we, uh, musicians, bands, whatever, just be people, or do they have to fit into a certain type bef before being noticed? Um, and how can we start making Irish music more mainstream, or is that possible? I don't know the answer to these questions. questions. Isn't it? That's, that's very I, I can't diagnose the Irish music scene's problems. They're the same probably as the problems in most of the world, uh, yeah. by and large. Except, yeah, Ireland is very small, so it inevitably will be very cliquey because course, there's yeah. only a certain amount of cool people and you know what they think becomes too important and uh yeah so I, it's important i think to get out of your comfort zone so the big fish in a small pond scenario uh i'd, I'd say get out into the world and have your ass kicked out there a while <laughs> that'll do you some good yeah we used to we used to say that idea that the only way to do it here is to, is to go elsewhere uh, and then you go to England and you ask the guys there and Jeez, they, they say the only way to do it... England's brutal. I'd, I'd yeah. go to America probably. You know, I think uh, they're, they're very passionate. Like Irish people, they're very passionate about live music yeah. and very responsive, you know. Um, so it's, it's, it's different in England. Is so England not a good training ground though? Because yeah, it's, but it's a very cynical place. Just, it's, just, it's just brutal. When I think of my early touring there, yeah. you know, the toilet tour, Yeah, it was... Bloody hard. So um, I, 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 I sort of I wouldn't recommend it as a, a cure for anything. No, I I, I, I remember that, uh, those ones myself. Uh, you know when you go into Happy Eater and you already you know what you want. I'm happy you eater. Yeah, you're unhappy eater. <laughs> and I used to, I just one particular story. A, a, a mandolin player had a purple quiff like that stuck up like Tintin at the time. That sounds like a good line, first line for a song. Yeah, there, there, there you go. Um, <laughs> But where the happy eater looks exactly like him from a side profile. So we used to walk in and children would cry as he walked into the happy eater thinking he's come alive. He was there, he was there Ronald McDonald. Um, it, here's, would you rather fight 100 duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck? <laughs> there you go, that's an actual well, that, question. That's from Tar oh, 100, 100 duck-sized horses yeah. sounds good. Or, or one, one horse-sized duck. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that's the best question. That's been, that's yeah. kind of been the best no, question so far. That's very creative. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah. So we're probably out of time now, are we? <laughs> Five minutes. Okay. The okay. battle commence. <laughs> the battle commence. Um, um, how long have you been playing with, with Bonzo? I've been well, playing with Bobby. Robert His Malone. first gigs were the summer of 1999. Entirely. Yeah. Wow. Slain, I think, might have been his, one of his first shows. There was, I think, that we did a show. Uh, we did a show in a show in Dublin. Yeah. Uh, a show in Dolans, and then I think it was Slain Castle. So we had two gigs to warm up for it. Yeah. So that was Bobby's first run into it. And and you 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 guys have kind of kind of stuck together since, really, haven't you? Yeah. Well, I, um, he, he's a very creative musician, oh, yeah. much more than a, a bass player. So uh, he's he took a bit of encouraging to come out of his shell initially. It was like he'd got a bass playing gig, but I sensed there was a lot more there. So I kind of clipped him around the ear and said, <laughs> come on. And then the, he, we've never looked back. He, he, so he, he still comes up with ideas. I think any musician who's in my band, it's like I just they have to throw themselves into it with, the same, with yeah. the same gusto that I do. Yeah. So no matter what you're doing, be it a promo thing or just jamming, yeah. you know what I mean, in the dressing room, wherever, working something out, someone who just, and he's always been like, oh, what's that? Want to get involved. Mm. 
So it's a it's a good quality to have, you know. Do, do you actually enjoy that the the, the, the band um, camaraderie? Have you have you kind of grown accustomed to it? Well, it's it's yeah, it's it's a vital part of the whole thing. Yeah. So I mean, the bands have changed over the years, but uh, it's. Um, yeah, I mean, well, touring is a sort of form of madness. Yes. And, uh, you know, the in-jokes, it's like an ingrowing toenail. By the end of the tour, it's sort of like they've, they've got, they've distorted into something that no one yeah. would ever understand. understand yeah. uh, oh, that's so funny. Uh, but, um, you know, but you need all that. It's like, you know, you're basically sleep deprived, exhausted. You're on a sort of adrenaline cycle. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, you need good people around. Um, and the world is a crazy place. You travel around it, you see some mad stuff. Um, there's plenty of there's plenty of food for for humour. It is best experience with other people, though, really. Oh yeah, it? yeah, it's great. It's a it's a it's a it's a wonderful thing. Well, I think we'll we'll wrap it up on that one. Yeah. Nice one. Pleasure. An Cheers. Absolute pleasure, David. <laughs> We're out of here. <laughs>